Okay, hello YouTube. Um, today I'm going to be taking a look at something I guess that's kind of interesting. Um, Gary Kasparov came back and he played some Blitz chess today. And of course, Gary Kasparov's result today, um, you know, you can see I'm scrolling through kind of the article here. It was pretty much about as disastrous as it could possibly be. He scored half a point out of nine. And okay, to understand what what went wrong like we have to number one talk about like Kasparov as a player back when he was playing full-time and uh, what his approach to the game of chess is and was and we have to talk about um, of course you know what happens to chess players you know just as we get as we get older you know I myself am I'm dealing with this difficulty as well I'm you know I'm 39 years old I'm, I'm quite a bit younger than um, Gary Kasparov but the problems compound, you know, as you age, and um, these problems they get they tend to get bigger and bigger. Um, but the first thing is is Gary Kasparov is a chess player. He's um, a, a amazing opening theoretician, um, the, the greatest opening theoretician that that pretty much ever lived. And this was kind of what kept him, you know, the boss, you know, just the the absolute best player in the world for for so many years. This is how he dominated the chess world was with his creativity and with with his opening concepts. So this is the most concerning thing. I know a lot of people have seen the game where he actually lost in seven moves, you know, where he, you know, uh failed in the opening after only seven moves. Th this actually concerns me a little bit more. Gary Kasparov actually repeated this opening several times with Black, actually three times. And he managed to lose um, three games in a row. So we never saw this back when Kasparov was active. This absolutely um, never happened with Gary Kasparov. If he repeated an opening, you know, more than once, you could take it to the bank. It was a good opening. So let's kind of see what went wrong. Let's get in Gary Kasparov's, you know, head. Because the way that Gary Kasparov kind of approaches chess is he tries to always play to his opponent's um, weaknesses. He's always playing to the opponent, and he's always trying to find the best opening to play against the opponent. And, of course, if you want to find somebody's greatest weakness, that also happens to be their... I mean, their greatest strength, that also happens to be their greatest weakness. Um, you know, Gary Kasparov's greatest strength is his ability to find openings that upset his opponent's equilibrium, that get his opponents off balance and that, you know, put them on the back foot and put them in a situation where they are where they have a tendency to make mistakes. And, of course, Kasparov himself was technically nearly perfect when he played chess, and he played, you know, very nearly perfect endgames, very nearly perfect technical chess. His calculating ability was second to none. So he was never going to fail in the technical aspects of the game. So all he had left to do, really, was to imbalance the situation with his opponent's psychology. And he would attack his opponent's psychology through through the opening, and by finding an opening that they would feel uncomfortable in. So that's what he, I think, tried to do here, which is what he tried to do throughout his entire career. But this is also Kasparov's weakness. He has such a cognitive bias towards doing this. I think he's sometimes willing to accept positions that are... Uh, a little bit more, um, let's, let's just say, questionable, you know, maybe a position that the computer wouldn't like very much, right? So he's willing to play this position, and of course, you know, Queen F3, let's let's be fair, Queen F3 is actually, if Kasparov was researching this, this is pretty rare. And actually, already we're talking about a position that's been played very few times, like you have to go back almost to 2008, you know, when when we talk about, you know, the exact position we're talking about here with b5, a3, knight, c6, you almost have to go back to 2008. There's like maybe one game that um, was played between, uh, I think, uh, MVL and Ray Robson. I think Ray Robson was white. So we're talking about like a very rare subset of games already, right? So this, in Kasparov's mind, this is a success. Maybe he's gotten his opponents into something that's relatively unknown, and he's maybe trying to, you know, just play chess against them or get them uncomfortable. The problem is, is none of these guys are, are uncomfortable. All of these guys are full-time professional players. And, of course, the game of chess has changed um, pretty drastically in the last, you know, 20, 30 years. Um, and it's certainly changed quite a bit since Kasparov retired, you know, back in 2004, 2005. Um, the computers have just gotten so much better, and now all of the top players are training with computers 
So the Kasparov strategy is just a lot less effective. I mean, it's not um, uh, a coincidence that a player like Kramnik is the guy that finally took out Kasparov in a match. I mean, a guy with basically veins of ice that couldn't be rattled. And this basically goes against what Kasparov is is basically designed to do. He's designed to rattle his opponent and then defeat them with 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 perfect technique. And the the issue is is he's willing to go kind of pretty far away from an average assessment. He's willing to go a little bit further away from equal than other players are willing to go away from to rattle his opponent. And he did that in all three of these games. If you look at this position on Stockfish already. So so I want you to see like exactly what's going on here um, in the engine. So this is chess space that I've loaded here, and this is Stockfish 12, and this is Kasparov's position after knight c6. So right now it's not plus 1 for white quite yet. It's still about plus 4.7. But if we just go a few moves further in the game, like knight takes d4, rook takes d4, and then after queen c5, and then you can see that his opponent is finding every kind of top pick. And this is the problem with these technically accurate players that are working with computers every single day. They're very good at kind of feeling for the um, computer's top moves and finding them. And that's just not something Kasparov is used to. right? His opponent found rook d3, and then after rook b8, his opponent found b4, and you'll just see this assessment just take a hop, skip, and a jump after b4, and after it takes a little bit of time, we're hovering around like, you know, plus 1. It might dip down to plus 0.7, um, you know, but now it's jumping back up to plus 1. So Stockfish 12 is kind of having a field day with this position. It's really liking it for white. It's saying that this is close to a full pawn after b4. And of course, I don't think Kasparov ever ran into opponents back when he played that played this type of technical chess where they could run into this relatively unknown line and, you know, just whip out, you know, three top computer moves in a row and end up with a plus one. You know, so it's hard to say if this specific position was something that was in Kasparov's preparation. Of course, I have so much respect for Kasparov's preparation that I have to naturally assume that this is a position that he considered, but I don't know, right? And that's, an, an, you know, maybe another part of the problem. What computer training does to these players is they're able to take in these brand new positions that maybe they've never seen before, and they're able to play this perfect technical chess. So there are two other things that were going against Kasparov, um, you know, in these games, you know, he lost three games in a row. And of course, this one that I'm looking at right now on the screen, this was his game against, uh, I think, Van Forest, um, Van, Jordan Van Forest. But he also lost in the same position. He lost to Anand in this position as well. And um, he lost to Duda, Duda in this position as well. So he lost basically three games, not, not from this exact position at this point. At this point, we're only following the Van Forest game. Uh, he lost three games from this position. So there's two other things that went wrong here is as you get older, you calculate quite a bit slower. It's sort of like uh, the way I describe it is it takes a little while for the engine to get started. Right. So when the game became just a technical battle between him and his opponents, um, he was already handicapped because his opponents are full time tournament players and his opponents practice their technical chess every day and they train with computers. So. They're just going to be calculating at a much faster clip, at a much faster rate. They don't need to stop and think about it. And then the second thing that handicapped him was, if you're calculating slowly, the last thing you want to do is play five-minute games. You know, you're going to just eat up the clock. You're going to get into time pressure. And then if you do try to speed up and move faster to make sure you don't get into time pressure, you run into the second problem, which is that engine, that brain, is just moving much slower. So now when you move fast, you're just making bad moves, you're making mistakes. And this is unfortunately what happened, is the engine was moving slow when he finally started playing on his own, and then when he finally did just decide, oh boy, I'm getting in time pressure, I have to move, the moves that he made were, were, were generally speaking, mistakes. And this is a problem that all older players have. If anything, we should feel good to see Kasparov do this, 
because it lets all of us know that these are these are universal problems. So what are the things that that Kasparov needs to do? I mean, you can see this is over, you know, white wins. Um, what are the things that Kasparov needs to do if he wants to turn this around? There's a couple things he's going to need to do. He's going to need to train his tactics. You know, I know a guy that is his level is thinking to himself, this is nothing that he's ever had to work on in the past, but he's going to have to work on this. He's going to have to train his tactics. He's going to have to get a tactics trainer like a CT art. He's going to have to get um, a, a puzzles. He's going to have to actually do puzzles. And this is something that as older players we have to do. Even if it's just dumb, just looking at a thousand mates in one, a thousand mates in two, a thousand mates in three, it, it seems silly. And he's, he's not going to want to do it, but he's going to have to do it. He's got to speed up his brain significantly um, to do these technical things. And the second thing he's going to need to do to, to make a comeback is he is going to have to seriously tone down his, his opening preparation. He can't approach this the way he approached chess back in the 80s and 90s when players were less technically accurate. And it was okay to go, you know, minus one, you know, just to get somebody rattled and to get them to make bad moves. He needs to play it a little tighter. He's putting way too much emphasis on novelty. And he is not putting enough emphasis on just get a solid position, play solid chess, and then you have to just play that technical chess. I still think that his approach to openings and I think his approach to preparation is still very good. And I still think, you know, chess is a big enough game that a guy like Kasparov that can see things that nobody else can see, I think that he can still utilize this. I just think that he needs to tighten it in a little bit and just make sure that those positions are more are more fundamentally sound or, or closer to the truth of what the computers are telling us than what he's allowing for. Um, anyways, so I hope he can turn it around. Um, you know, Kasparov is an absolute legend, and he's probably one of, um, you know, the greatest players that ever lived, if not the greatest player that ever lived. And um, I am an absolute um, beginner compared to his knowledge and understanding about the game of chess. And I really absolutely hope that, that Kasparov can turn this around and, you know, he can just show us some spectacular games. Um, anyways, uh... I hope that uh, you found this video helpful, you know, to find out um, what's going on in the chess world. And I hope you learned something new about chess. And um, I hope Kasparov can turn this around and I hope Kasparov can play some better games. Anyways, thank you very much for watching. And um, if you like my content, just go ahead and uh, hit subscribe.